בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are uh, back, returning to our extraordinary series, עקבתא דמשיחא, The Era of Mashiach, based on the Kuntres, by הרב אלחנן וסרמן, עליו השלום. Uh, tonight's uh, שיעור will be... for a refuah uh, shlema for Aliza but uh, Sarah and uh, also for Rabbanit um, Levana but Sarah, Rabbi Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah but Anat, Itro ben Avraham, Talia but Sarah, Orit but Ilana, Stefan ben Katarina and also for a atzlacha uh, rabah for Shaul ben Farzane אושרי בן דוריס, גבי בן דוריס, אלעד בן דוריס, דוד בן עשריה, יתרו בן אברהם, מרשה בת ג'ולי, איילה בת מרשה, סמיול בן מרשה, אלכזנדר בן מרשה, ראובן חיים בן פעלה פארל, רחל בת פעלה פארל, שמואל יצחק בן פעלה פארל, ונפתלי צבי בן פעלה פארל, הקדוש ברוך הוא יברך אותם בכל מכל כל, חיים ארוכים שלמים מלאים תורה מצוות גמילות חסדים, to them and to all of עם ישראל, all of the righteous Noah hides, and especially the ones that are supporting us, helping us do all the things that we're doing, ברוך השם, uh, the uh, things continue to progress in the right direction and continue to grow. Uh, many more uh, uh, new people have uh, started watching our shiurim uh, over these uh, last uh, several weeks, Baruch Hashem. The, uh, the numbers are hitting new highs on a regular basis. Uh, but uh, one thing that uh, I'm noticing is that um, the app, uh, the Bezat Hashem app, is still not in uh, line with uh, amount of YouTube and Facebook followers. There's Baruch Hashem... A decent amount of people that are on the app but they're not enough and I emphasize and re-emphasize every single person should watch the Shurim on the Be'ezrat Hashem app it's not only the uh, the best app in the Torah world it's extremely fast very high technology for anyone that understands uh, technology has uh, a lot of wonderful features where you could speed up uh, or slow down the lecture you could share Uh, the lecture from the app to encourage other people not only to watch the lecture but also to download the app uh, you could donate on it you could ask questions which Baruch Hashem uh, we uh, started again answering the questions of the people and uh, Bezat Hashem will continue answering the questions of the people uh, directly on the app but uh, also it's the uh, most kosher app you could possibly find simply because There's no advertisements, there's no uh, commercials, there is simply Torah. I've had already several different companies uh, contact me and uh, different uh, businesses contact me, even people that I like and people that uh, are good people and ask me if uh, I'm willing to uh, uh, have their uh, advertisement on the app uh, and I uh, refuse to do it uh, simply because we want to keep it 100% Torah. Uh, so uh, for anyone who has not downloaded the app and is not using the app on a regular basis but instead is watching uh, the lectures on um, on YouTube uh, I highly recommend you go to uh, uh, the Be'ezrat Hashem website and uh, download the app it's uh, Be'ezrat Hashem on the App Store B-E-E-Z-R-A-T H-A-S-H-E-M you'll find it on the Android Store on the uh, iPhone Store Uh, and uh, there's also a link that uh, we share on a regular basis for you to uh, uh, to go directly to a website that has both uh, uh, available to you both the Android or the uh, uh, iPhone you choose obviously whichever one's appropriate for you but to watch the app on the, to watch the lectures on the app is the best recommendation I can give you guys in regards to watching the lectures simply because it's a uh, without the distractions a lot of times I see that you know people tell me yeah I started the lecture you know uh, you know when you posted it but it's you know I still haven't finished and it's two three days later and usually it's not because their life is so busy but rather because there's just so many distractions and it looks like people are busy uh, and especially when you have 
all types of suggestions of things that the Yetzirah makes extremely interesting on the side, all types of heretics that, uh, you know, have uh, catchy titles to, to bait you, to uh, listen to their heresy and their nonsense. You have to uh, treat the Torah as if it's Torah and not something else. And, uh, you know, it's important to watch the lectures without any distractions. Uh, at the very least, do your best to eliminate the distractions. And that way you'll be able to, uh, to watch the lectures in peace, remember a lot more. And I know even for myself, if I have uh, something that I'm uh, learning, uh, whether it's a book or it's a uh, video of some kind, and I have other things going on, whether it's a, uh, my terminal on for WhatsApp and all the questions people ask, uh, Baruch Hashem, nonstop, or it's email or it's my phone or anything else, um, you know, even if I'm able to complete reading or watching what I need to watch, uh, I don't remember even half of what I would typically remember. And the reason why is because your mind is not 100% there. There's distractions. So again, for those that have not downloaded the app, uh, please do. Uh, and also in regards to uh, the few people that have asked me in regards to uh, doing live, they want to watch the lectures live. Uh, as far as having a live audience, uh, you know, because right now in, in the last few months, we've been doing our shulim out of my house with no audience and uh, we'll continue doing that for a little while longer uh, until we uh, finalize getting our place, getting a, a new synagogue and Bet Midrash, uh, which uh, we still are looking for and Bezal uh, Hashem still, uh, uh, you know, working on, but uh, that's going to take a little time. So uh, if I had to estimate, if, if a, uh, you know, it's going to take at least a few months, uh, you know, three, four months before we have live lectures again, uh, unless, you know, people want to host us and arrange large events. You know, a few people have asked me if I want to do uh, smaller events with 5, 10, 20 people. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just not, uh, I'm not uh, uh, going to add any more to my schedule. Uh, I'm already overwhelmed as it is with all the lectures that we're already doing and all the other work that we're doing. So we're not going to be doing anything additional uh, to what we're doing right now. Uh, but if somebody wants to arrange something that's more than what we're doing, they want to bring two, three, four hundred people together and, uh, you know, and, and host something, then there's something to speak of. But uh, to just get a lecture of 10, 20 people, it's just, uh, uh, it's too much uh, to add to the schedule. Uh, if anybody wants to watch our lectures, they're more than welcome to watch them online. There's Baruch Hashem, uh, over 2,000 lectures on the internet and, uh, of course, three live uh, uh, lectures each week. Um, as far as um, uh, the uh, live uh, lectures on a, uh, a technical pro uh, format, uh, as far as you know, doing the YouTube live or uh, Facebook live or anything else live, uh, we've contemplated doing YouTube live as well, but I really don't see much of the purpose. Facebook is sufficient for now, uh, and uh, those that only have YouTube will just simply have to wait till the next day uh, to, to watch the lectures. I don't really see much of a purpose of doing it. Uh, you know, we're still contemplating it, though. Uh, it's a lot more uh, difficult than people think. It's not just putting another phone and recording. There's a lot more to do with bandwidth and things like that. But one thing that we are working on is to add a live feature to, uh, to the app and uh, to encourage us to, uh, uh, to really um, invest the, uh, the, the amount of, uh, money and, uh, and time necessary to do it. We definitely need uh, a lot more people to sign up to the app. So we know that it's worth it because if I see that everybody's still staying on Facebook and everywhere else, it doesn't really make sense to spend uh, all this, uh, money and time to develop a new feature. Uh, so with that being said, uh, you know, the, uh, the cards that we mentioned, uh, a few days ago, uh, are going to be available on the uh, website Bezat Hashem this week for anyone that wants to order them uh, to, uh, to to give out in their communities. Uh, it's a uh, Baruch Hashem, a uh, came out beautiful. You have the postcards with where you could put stamps on them, and then you have the posters themselves. Both are going to be available Bezat Hashem uh, in the next uh, day or so. Also, the car magnet uh, is uh, Bezat Hashem going to be available as well. And we're working on a few other things, Bezat Hashem, uh, that are going to be available for you guys to uh, do Kiruv and to share it with the public. The, the most powerful movie uh, that's uh, ever hit the Torah world in the English language, uh, you know, it's, it's simply uh, the movie has made countless people do tshuva already. 
And uh, every day, every day I get people that uh, tell me that they're doing tshuva just simply from just watching the movie. People that uh, were keeping nothing are now keeping literally everything they know about. Uh, just the wake-up call that they got from that movie makes people uh, change relatively quickly. So I highly recommend people continue to uh, donate for the campaign of the Tikkun Abrit, uh, continue supporting uh, by uh, sharing these, uh, uh, these cards in their community. And even if you can't uh, share them yourself, uh, you could still donate and we could use that money to, uh, uh, to buy more of them and to send it to different people. And uh, Bezot Hashem, Naseh V'Natzliach. As far as the, uh, the series of Rav Wasserman, of course, we took a little bit of a break, a couple of weeks break, and now we're going to go back to it. But to give you a little bit of a reminder, I mean, this is going to be one of the uh, more exciting shiurim, uh, more uh, fireworks, uh, as we've seen each and every lecture uh, always has a little bit of fireworks, but uh, the Era of Mashiach series has had more fireworks than probably all of the lectures combined, because we see that Rav Wasserman, in his time, during uh, literally the time of the Holocaust, uh, was fighting the very same fight that we are fighting today. All of the different types of heretical teachings that became uh, publicly distributed, all of the people that uh, were distributing them, calling themselves rabbis, all of the nonsense that uh, came out from the Zionists. And uh, of course, people like to uh, look at the positive side of things and say, listen, uh, you know, the Zionists, you know, you have a, uh, uh, right now, Yom Atzma'ut, Independence Day, uh, the uh, uh, Remembrance Day, the Holocaust. And the question is, what are we really commemorating? What are we really uh, remembering? You know, people are saying that, okay, so you have, uh, although these people did some bad things, these Zionists, as we've discussed in other lectures, they, uh, they still did some good stuff. What is the good stuff? Uh, we established the State of Israel. Uh, you know, the, the truth is, is that uh, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to give us Israel, he didn't need a bunch of Rishayim to do it. And uh, what a lot of people don't know is that there was uh, quite a few religious Jews that were already in Eretz Yisrael, in, uh, you know, in living in Eretz Yisrael and uh, uh, learning Torah and uh, distributing Torah in Eretz Yisrael well before the Zionists uh, ever came to Eretz Yisrael. And in fact, uh, most of what the Zionists brought to the world is a destruction for Am Yisrael. But a lot of people don't know that because they look at the so-called highlights of certain things. And uh, as I always like to mention the truth to people that is in front of you, but apparently unknown to you. And uh, in a uh, several times I've mentioned some of the statements of the, uh, of the Zionists and really what's behind them, what they've done, and so on. And I'll give you guys a little bit of an example. Uh, in a uh, sefer called Perfidy, uh, Ben Echt, Ben Echt, uh, this is a uh, very uh, well-known story for the older generation, but completely unknown uh, by the modern generation. Uh, to be honest with you, I myself, until I read this uh, uh, book, I haven't completed it yet, but uh, until I started reading it, I didn't really know about the story myself. One of my dear students and friends uh, uh, recommended it to me. Uh, and uh, more friends than students, but nonetheless, uh, Talmit Chacham recommended this book to me, and I've, I've seen the book before, but never read it. And uh, it has extraordinary information of really horrible, horrible things that happened that were very well known uh, at the time, but simply were swept under the carpet, swept under the carpet uh, over the last several decades as if it's unknown, as if it's forgotten, and the truth is, is that anyone that uh, really wants to be a true Zionist uh, in accordance with the Torah has to be the most religious person on planet Earth. Uh, but unfortunately today, Zionism uh, already for generations has uh, become synonymous with heretical teachings, has become synonymous with uh, uh, the opposite of Torah, the destruction of the Torah, and uh, it remains so today, even though there are some uh, uh, parts of uh, the Jewish people that are call themselves uh, religious Zionists, uh, you know, and they're uh, perfectly, uh, you know, they're, they're decent people, and uh, there's definitely many decent people among them. 
The reality is that their definition of Zionism is worlds apart from the definition of Zionism according to the rest of the world, both the Jewish and the non-Jewish. When people are celebrating the Yom HaTzma'ut and Yom HaZikaron, all of these uh, different things in the next uh, couple of days on Thursday, uh, many people are celebrating Herzl Zionism and Weizmann Zionism and uh, uh, Ben-Gurion Zionism and the, the state, the land, really the very same thing that Rav Elchanan Wasserman, Rav Shalom, was fighting in his day uh, until the Nazis Imachshima murdered him. But uh, one of the things that, uh, one, you know, that the uh, Zionists like to do is they like to celebrate their heroes. There are streets in Eretz Yisrael named after the Zionists, whether it's Herzl Imachshima, who himself uh, uh, um, did not uh, uh, circumcise his son and converted to Christianity, uh, and uh, or or it's the uh, the others that were completely uh, for the Christians and uh, or atheists. And this is not nothing has really changed. What a lot of people don't know is they think that the current leadership is any different. The current leadership is no different whatsoever. It's uh, literally just changed the uh, the faces, but uh, and the names. Everything is pretty much the same. If you look at people like Avigdor Imach Shimov or Lapid, they're anti-Torah, they hate the Torah, they even have uh, commercials, uh, you know, advertising their campaigns of how their goal is to destroy the religious world. Their number one enemy is not Hamas. Their number one enemy is not the terrorist. Their no- number one enemy is not... A, anyone that's an enemy of Israel, but rather the number one enemy, and they say themselves, is the religious people. And that's why Avigdo had a commercial saying that it's time to throw all of the Orthodox people into the garbage. And this is something that if a non-Jew would have said this anywhere else in the world, especially in America, that person would lose his uh, job most likely, lose his reputation, and perhaps even uh, uh, lose money as a result of it. Okay, if, uh, if, if that was done anywhere else, that person would be uh, targeted. Okay, if, if somebody said, let's throw all the black people in the garbage, surely that person is not only an evil person, but that person would be targeted and part of the news and highlighted of how no one should ever be associated with this person ever again. If somebody said, throw all of the Spanish people into the garbage, surely everyone would say, this guy is a bad guy, don't listen to him, he's an evil person, he's uh, crazy. If somebody said, throw all the Japanese, Chinese, Arab, uh, Christian people into the garbage, surely everybody would go against that person. But in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of the, the Holy Land, the place of the Jews apparently, somebody says, it's time to throw all of the Orthodox people, the religious people, into the garbage. What do they do? They give him the opportunity to become the Prime Minister. And this is what he does during the campaign. And that's no different than Lapid, who says the same exact thing in different words, or the Rasha from Tveria, who just had another video saying that the religious people are destroying the land. And this is what's happening. Now, if everybody says, yeah, but Bibi Netanyahu is a good guy. He's a good guy if we were Christians on Chaz <laughs> Shalom. If we're Christians, Bibi Netanyahu would be a good guy. But Baruch Hashem, since we're Jews, he's not a good guy. Why? Because he has many Christian missionaries working on his staff as i've mentioned in the past and have proved in the past having christian missionaries on his staff i would not be surprised if bibi netanyahu is himself one of these fake uh, 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 jews that call themselves messianic jews uh, because he's apparently very very close to them so close that during the whole covid 19 epidemic that everybody was crazy about in Eretz Yisrael and really all over the world, but more so in Eretz Yisrael than really anywhere else, during that time where anyone that was walking around the streets uh, would be fined. And if you walked around with a no mask in the streets, they'd beat you up. Bibi Netanyahu allowed multiple planes full of Christian missionaries to fly into Eretz Yisrael. No one else was allowed to get on a plane going in or out but the christian missionaries were allowed to go into eretz israel and by who signature of bb netanyahu and this is what's happening in the world today and this is all under the same premise that same teachings which is the umbrella of zionism that's the reality 
that's the truth now how did it start this way yes it was actually even worse one of the so-called heroes of zionism is the first president of israel first president of israel modern day israel is a guy by the name of chaim weizman who uh, is uh, is so-called a one of the leaders of uh of uh of, of israel at the time and he uh overnight became an englishman he went from nothing to something called himself an englishman and uh became the uh, uh leader of the world zionism world zionism movement in the uh, 1930s and later on became the first president of uh, of israel and uh surely achieved quite a bit in material success but he said I mean, this is all for the love of the jews right well let's see it says here in page 19 that of the six million of the six million jews who were in a few years to be exterminated by the germans dr weizmann addressing 480 zionist delegates 1500 visitors 200 press correspondents in all corners of the earth and official foreign representatives from a score of nations had this to say quote i told the british royal commission that the hopes of europe's six million jews were centered on emigration i was asked can you bring six million jews to palestine as it was named at that time i replied no says weizmann the old ones will pass meaning they're all gonna die they will bear their fate or they will not they were dust economic and moral dust in a cruel world only a branch shall survive they had to accept it if they feel and suffer they will find the way meaning in the day in the end of days in the fullness of time i pray that we may, pre- we may preserve our national unity for it is all we have they asked him can you take all you you know you want to have Eretz israel called palestine still but can you bring all six million jews from uh from uh, palestine from uh europe over there no no can't bring them. they're dust we only want a certain type of jew their dust their fate is already written caring less about six million jews who ended up becoming annihilated yet becoming the president of israel the most ridiculous thing in history and another time in uh, on a radio show in the 22nd of june 1941 according to the gregorian calendar the radio brought the news germany had launched an offensive on russia the germans had already marched through the border and the person watched Wiseman. his eyes were dark and this is what he had to say quote this is the second time he said he recalled that when the first world war broke out two years after the death of his father his mother still lived in pinkst and had to escape from the fear of the german invasion meaning he was talking about the first world war and now they come again the germans what will be the fate of all of these people i saw in his eyes the tragic vision of what has really happened to them there was a silence in the room and then Wiseman began to speak saying yes for our people there for millions of them a horrible and monstrous fate is waiting but after a moment his lights his eyes lighted up his body leaned forward and he said at the end and this is the most important thing this war is bound to bring about a blessing to england this is the first president of modern day israel this is who they put as president a person that cared less about the jewish people cared less about judaism cared less about anything other than his own materialistic success and unfortunately Rabotaya Karim many times you have 
decent young men that mean well, that want to promote Eretz Yisrael, whether it's that young man Rudy or other people out there that call themselves, you know, Zionists and they're pro-Israel and they uh, say they have a right to exist and all of this stuff. These people do not know any of the information that we're discussing. Why? They still believe that Zionism is very much a good thing. Uh, and unfortunately, Rabotai, Zionism is not part of Judaism, but rather Zionism is a way that the wicked people try to destroy Judaism back then and still today. And it's very important to know that there's a very, very big difference between being anti-Zionist and anti-Israel. To be anti-Israel, you have to obviously be anti-Semitic, hate Jews, hate, uh, hate the world, hate your own life even. Why? Because Israel is Baruch Hashem, the land that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, and uh, we all, uh, Be'ezot Hashem, will have a merit to live there one day, and those that do, Baruch Hashem. There's a lot of Torah over there, there's a lot of Kedusha over there, despite all of the wicked people that are running the government over there. So to support Israel is definitely a good thing, and uh, especially the, the Torah over there. But to, to be a supporter of the Zionist uh, teachings and a Zionist mentality is a mistake that many people that call themselves religious make day in, day out. And uh, especially those that follow politics very closely and care so much about politics, thinking that this politician is going to be different because he's wearing a kippah and he's not wearing a kippah and this guy means well and he says well. They're all the same thing. From the beginning to the end, that's why the root of the uh, word politician comes from Greek, meaning a, a, a tick or a bloodsucker. Uh, so to be, a, to be a politician, a person needs to already have the nature, bad nature in its, himself, to, to uh, suck the blood out of society, and the Zionists are some of the best at it in history. There's no much of a difference in different countries, whether it be the U.S. or, or England, other places, but nonetheless, it's important for us to know the truth of who is our enemy and who is our friend. Anyone that is anti-Torah is by default their enemy, regardless of whether they're Jew or Gentile. Anyone that is ignorant of the Torah could very well be an enemy or a friend. Uh, they may not, they just are ignorant, so we haven't really we can't really decide for them. Only if they're ones that go against the Torah are they automatically our enemy. But if they're ignorant of the Torah, sometimes they they could be even better friends than uh, your your neighbor that's religious. They just uh, don't know why they're uh, not religious yet. They don't know anything about Judaism. But the key is to understand that. All of the things that we mention are things that are quoted in the Sfarim, in the books, in history, and it's important for us to know the truth because it's important to know where you came from in order to know where you want to go and where you're going. Because if we just continue to walk blindly into history, blindly into society, we are doomed because unfortunately Am Yisrael and the world at large has repeated the same mistakes over and over again, but this time we're not going to have a, uh, a, uh, much of it more time, much more chances. This is the era of Mashiach. This is the time where everybody gets their last chance to get on Hashem's train once and for all. Those that succeed will be praiseworthy and meritorious for eternity, and those that fail, Hashem Yishmo. Those that fail are doomed. As the prophet Zechariah says in chapter 14 and also the prophet Yechezkel says in chapter 38, the overwhelming majority of the world uh, is, is uh, not going to be on the good side. Two-thirds of the world will be wiped out in the last war called Gog and Magog. That still leaves a large amount of people that will have the opportunity to survive and be part of Hashem's world. But it's not going to be for free. It's not going to be uh, easy. It's not going to be without... Uh, desires and temptations to do the wrong thing. It's not going to be a, uh, without uh, confusions. In fact, it's going to be the most confusing time in the world. And the only solution, the only solution is to make your, sure that you are educated on a regular basis of what the truth is and you have the courage to follow what the truth is. Now, Rav Wasserman told us that in his time, which is really no different than today, these modern type thinkers, some were Zionists, some were people that uh, didn't necessarily call themselves Zionists, but they were modern type thinkers. Many rabbis that were uh, 
clearly part of the Erev Lav, just like today, that were doing different things in creative ways. Some of them were blatantly going against the Torah, saying that they hate it, while others were pretending to like the Torah in order to entice more and more religious people to join them and to destroy those people. And that's what many of these people did when the Jews of Yemen and Morocco and different parts of the world came into modern-day Israel. First thing that they made sure is to cut off their peyot, to uh, tell them they don't need to learn to lie anymore, and that if they want to get the food stamps to eat, they have to join their schools. Now, what are these schools? They said, no, these schools have everything that you need. And that's the part that we got to. What are these schools, really? The big thing that these uh, Zionists and these modern thinkers, both then and today, always preach is the significance of the land. Now, the acquisitions of Eretz Yisrael, Rav Wasserman says, does not depend on our will. What a lot of people don't realize is that Eretz Yisrael is not something that we got because the Zionists were clever with other fellow politicians. The land is not something that we got because we were uh, such amazing tzaddikim either. The land was given to us because Hashem decided it's time. It's time that Am Yisrael starts returning to Eretz Yisrael for the reasons that he has, all known to him, very limited known to mankind. But nonetheless, the land was given to us just like the Bet HaMikdash will eventually, Be'ezrat Hashem, be given to us. It's not something that the Jewish people are supposed to build. There are many fools out there or con men that tell people, why don't you donate to the campaign so we can build the next Bet HaMikdash? And literally, millions of dollars are donated to fake campaigns with the uh, assumption that this money will one day be used to build the third temple, the Bet HaMikdash. The third Bet HaMikdash is not going to be built by human hands. It's going to be something that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to bring down from Shemaim. But a lot of people don't know this. And the reality is, is that their ignorance is not only costing them money, but it's also costing them mitzvot. Why is it costing them mitzvot? Because had they given that money to publicize the Torah, for the right reasons, they could have this uh, money earn them a new section in heaven, a new section in Olam Abba. But instead, they're giving it to the wrong people that are con men, that are liars, and that are ignorant altogether. And of course, they uh, they lose out in both ways. They work, but their money not only is not going for their own physical pleasure, but it's not even going to their spiritual pleasure. Now you're going to say, wait, well, I feel bad. It's not really their fault. There is no such thing. It's not really their fault. The Gemara says that the heavenly Bedin, the heavenly uh, judicial court, decides who to give merits to and who to give obligations to, meaning who to give good things to that will help them earn a better place in heaven and who to give things that will cause them to sin even more or give them more problems. And who does it give it to? The meritorious, the, uh, the, uh, the opportunities to earn more reward are given to the people that are already meritorious. And the problems, the headaches, the obligations, the opportunities to sin even more are given to the people that already have many sins. Why is it done that way? Because a Kadosh Baruch Hu has a law. Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says, Schar mitzvah mitzvah, schar chova, schar avera avera that the reward for a mitzvah is another mitzvah, and the reward for a sin is another sin. The, the, the punishment for a sin is another sin. So when somebody does a mitzvah, he becomes meritorious, Hashem cannot give him his real reward in this world because there's not enough in this world. There's not enough material. There's not enough money. There's not enough joy in this world. Even if you combine the whole world's joy into a single box, that's not even enough to pay a reward for a single mitzvah that you do. So the reward that Hashem gives a person in this world for a good deed, for a mitzvah that he does, is an opportunity to do another mitzvah. That's the reward, as the Rambam says. And the, 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 the punishment, the punishment for a sin, the Rambam says, 
is an opportunity an enticement a temptation to do another sin hence the reason why people that waste seed can't get out of their own way they have a tough time learning Torah they have a tough time keeping Shabbat they don't like to pray they don't like anything why because they have so many sins and so many demons that they've created from wasting seed or from women that are walking around immodestly and creating sins everywhere and demons everywhere or from people that are causing the public to sin in different ways these people can't get out of their own way it's very tough for them to do tshuva why because they're still getting paid for all the sins with opportunities to sin even more that's why the rambam says that to some of the people that almost impossible for them not impossible but almost impossible for them to do tshuva are people that cause the public to sin because each and every single time the people that they cause to sin makes another sin again as a result of the original sin that they made them do they get that punishment for it which is what to get enticed to make another sin so it's a unfortunate situation but they make their bed and they have to sleep in it too so here Rabotai Karim, many people will tell you that Eretz Yisrael is an important thing and it is an important thing it's a mitzvah but it's not the ikar it's not the priority of Am Yisrael and it doesn't depend on our will whether we will live there or not whether we uh, get it or not that's in the hands of Hashem what's in our hands Rav Wasserman says to spread the Torah among the masses to do Kiruv that's in our hands to spread the Torah to make sure that we learn Torah and share it with other people that we share the real Torah not the uh, Torah of uh, uh, pedophile promoters like Manus Friedman not the Torah that's a completely different religion of some of these sects not the Torah of the Christians that they call it Messianic Judaism not the Torah of modern Judaism that uh, in essence why are you called modern Judaism because we want to modernize things what does it mean to modernize things eliminate mitzvot no we don't want that Torah we want the full Torah just like Moshe Rabbeinu that's what we want that's in our hands you have in your hands the opportunity to share false Torah and heresy and all types of things but that's not going to get you a better place in heaven it's quite the opposite Rav Wasserman says the only thing that's in our hands is to share more Torah you watching this lecture right now press share I see so far 450 people were smart enough to share this video but that isn't nothing nothing in comparison to the amount of people that are going to watch this lecture and every single person that watches these lectures and shares it not to the same place over and over again but to different people and makes an an effort to share it with different people directly indirectly in groups and so on these are smart people why these people are sharing Torah now somebody doesn't have uh, a lot of contacts or doesn't have a lot of time to share Torah don't worry you can still share Torah how having us do it by continuing to uh, contribute monthly on a regular basis to help us spread the Torah in the world make more films make more lectures make more different tools for Am Yisrael and the world at large to get closer to the truth that's what our obligation is and that is the only thing that's in our hands of Wasserman says and he who strives towards spiritual perfection of Wasserman quotes the Gemara obtains divine help a person that really wants to become perfect spiritually do complete tshuva needs to share the Torah with the world you can't just learn by yourself and expect to become the biggest tzaddik because even the Chovot Alevavot the Chovot Alevavot written by Rabbeinu Bechaye 800 years ago says that if uh if if someone has Torah like Moshe Rabbeinu and good deeds like Moshe Rabbeinu he's still not in the same level as someone that is involved in Kiruv on a regular basis that shares Torah with the world on a regular basis either teaching or arranging lectures or donating substantial amounts of money at least uh, relatively speaking to each person the millionaire has to donate millions the uh the the, the person that's an average uh, blue collar worker donates whatever is uh, avail- uh, available to them everybody does to the best of their ability but really the best of their ability that person that person not the quantity but that person is more is more praiseworthy has a higher reward than another person that has mitzvot and Torah like Moshe Rabbeinu that's what the Chovot HaLevavot says 
why because of that is in a person that becomes a partner with Hashem that is a person that understands the purpose of the world residence in Eretz Israel is a mitzvah but the establishment of groups of heretics is a great transgression and not a mitzvah this is not the building up of the Torah but rather the ruin of the Torah in the land as it says they do not guard the city but rather destroy it this ruin by these heretics by these false teachers whether they're the false teachers of Zionism or modern or reform or conservative any of these people that distort the Torah these are who he's talking about 80 years ago these people cause a ruin that is worse and more dangerous than any disaster that the gentile nations have ever brought on the jewish people because at least the previous catastrophes that the romans or the greeks or the spaniards or the babylonians brought on to am Yisrael, killing millions upon millions of us at least those catastrophes brought a kapara an atonement for am israel that suffering in the holocaust that suffering in the spanish inquisition that suffering in the destruction of the beta mikdash the first and the second one that suffering at least brought an atonement for am israel that at least helped us helped us pay for some sins that we've made but this ruin this ruin that is coming from the heretics from the manus freedmans of the world and the uh, moshe weinbergers of the world that says that if you're listening to someone that talks about punishment run away from him says that there's no need to teach people about reward and punishment according to weinberger you could pretty much cancel out the torah or if you go to other heretics like shlomo riskin who distorts the torah on a regular basis and even one said that if when he sees the Mashiach he's going to ask him is this the first time or the second time that you came because he's very interested and an avid reader of the New Testament but yet calls himself an Orthodox Jew you know I often think if someone were to announce that the Messiah is here who would actually want him the Jews Messiah means the Jews will have to move to Israel. I doubt that the Jews throughout the world are ready right now to move to Israel. So I don't think many, many people would be interested in his coming. Except religious Christians and religious Jews. And we will all run out to greet him and ask him one critical question. Is this the first time you're coming or the second time you're coming? If you go to Shlomo Riski and you ask him what do you think of the situation in the Jewish world where women that are not able to get a get from their husbands and according to the Torah the get is the uh, in the power of the uh, of the husband that's according to the Torah that's according to the Chachamim what do you think Mr. Riskin Riskin quote said in the year 2017 the ability to give a divorce must be taken away out of the hands and the control of the husband he cannot have this power the ancient jewish divorce laws which are believed to be divine in origin are the subject of intense debate amongst israel's rabbinical leaders and rabbi shlomo riskin is one of the most controversial and radical of them We took the road through a checkpoint on the edge of Jerusalem into the heart of the West Bank to find him in the sprawling Jewish settlement of Ifrat, where he's chief rabbi. I'm an Orthodox rabbi and a proud Orthodox rabbi who believes and loves the Jewish legal system. And all of the solutions can be found in order to free women who are being kept to marriages unfairly by recalcitrant husbands. The solutions are all there. They were in the Talmud 2,000 years ago. The tragedy is that the overwhelming majority of rabbinic judges are not realizing and effectuating the proper solutions. And that's tragic. 
and that's a desecration of God's name. At the heart of the divorce laws is the husband's right to refuse a divorce to his wife. Written in the Torah, the Bible, it's a law which is said to have been given by God to Moses. Can this divine law ever be changed? Rabbi Riskin believes that the answer lies in the other source of Jewish law, the Talmud, the oral law which was developed over the centuries by leading scholars. The ability to give the divorce must be taken out of the hands of the husband. He can't have that unilateral power. The Talmud is very clear. The Talmud says, you force the husband to give a writ of divorce until he says, I want to give it. Now that's very strange language. It seems like an oxymoron. So the rabbis explain it very well. It's as if I was sitting at a wedding with my wife and a waiter came with a wonderful dessert, a fancy chocolate fudge cake, and the waiter would ask me, Rabbi, would you like a piece of cake? And before I have a chance to answer, my wife would say, he doesn't want the cake. But I say, I do want the cake. She says, no, no, no. That's your lower will that wants the cake. Your higher will understands cholesterol, extra calories. It's not good for you. You don't want the cake. A good Jew wants to do what's right. If a religious court says what's right is that he give a divorce, that's his higher will, and we force him to carry out his higher will. I'm not saying anything radical at all. The radical ones are those who refuse to express this Jewish law. Because the rabbis of the Talmud 2,000 years ago understood that husbands could act the scoundrels and there has to be a way in which the rabbis would allow the women to be freed. At the core of all the problems is the uh, fact that the man gives the get. That's, that's essentially the crucial core in Jewish law, in the halakha. Is there any flexibility uh, in interpreting that? No, there are many who argue so, but they are not knowledgeable enough about Jewish law. It is possible in a case where it is found that there was a fundamental mistake in the marriage. We can cancel it if there was a mistake such as a major defect in the husband that was hidden from the woman. But that would have to be proved. So, in principle, there is that option, but we cannot take the power out of the husband's hands. He's a very great person who has always been very compassionate to the woman who needs a divorce. But there's a great deal of religious literature that would certainly say that this is possible. This is the language of the Talmud. Everyone who sanctifies does it with the permission of the rabbis of that generation. And the rabbis of that generation, if they see he is acting improperly, they can abrogate the sanctification, the marital act from him. And that's the Talmud. That's as halachic and as orthodox as you can get in five different passages. Believe me, if I know it, he knows it. So what does he mean, this riskin, imach shima? What does he mean? He means that the rabbi should decide whether the woman is married or not married. Not the Torah. The rabbis, the modern-day rabbis, they should decide if the woman is, uh, is married or not. This, unfortunately, Rabbi Karim is already several years old, but the fruits of this rotten tree are coming out today where many people in the Jewish community in New York and other places are learning about this heretic's words and are actually listening to it and are deciding that even though the wicked ex-husband of theirs does not want to give them a get they are going to listen to the heretic riskin that says you can get remarried even without it how find some of uh riskin's uh students and he's going to decide that you're divorced, more or less. 
That's the way they're going to do it. Either the rabbi is going to decide that you're divorced. This rabotai is bringing a destruction to the world. Such a destruction that if that woman actually does get married and have kids, those kids will be mamzerim, which are people that are not allowed to be married to other normal Jews. This is a destruction of Israel. And this is what this Riskin is doing. And all of his uh, followers are doing evil things like this. Modernizing the Torah is not just saying, you're, you know, you don't have to do this and you don't have to do that. Modernizing the Torah comes in all different formats. Many times I te- tell you about all types of people that pretend to know a thing or two and say, no, I think that Gainom is only 12 months because it says it in this place and that place. There's no bigger stupidity than that to believe that Gainom, that punishment is a maximum of 12 months. And even the Ramban writes, Nachmanides writes 800 plus years ago in the Shah Agmul section 7, where he says that anyone that says that the Gainom is only 12 months is 100% a heretic who has no share of the God of Israel because he's making God into an evil God. Because any normal person, any normal person understands that there is different punishments for different crimes. If you stole some money, you're not going to get, or at least you're not supposed to get the same same punishment as someone who stole more than you, or someone that did a worse crime than you, like uh, pedophilia, rape, or, or murder, and so on. But in the eyes of these heretics, everyone has a maximum punishment of 12 months. Which means that there's really no reason to observe the Torah whatsoever with such a teaching. Why? Because if everybody's going to get the same punishment no matter what, what's the point of keeping anything? Because there's no such thing as a perfect human being. Everybody's going to sin. You're going to sin. I'm going to sin. Everyone's going to sin. Even if it's not on purpose, you're going to have mistakes at some point or another. Everybody's going to sin. So if everybody's going to sin and anywhere going to go 12 months maximum, what's the point of keeping anything? Go enjoy yourself, right? That's what happens when people distort the Torah to their own likings. And that's the fight that the Ramban had to fight 800 years ago. Nothing has changed in 800 years. We see from Rav Wasserman, he fought the same thing, same type of modernizing and distorting of the Torah. People that made the land and materialism and different things more important than what the Torah said itself. So what ends up happening is that they end up become bringing a destruction to Am Yisrael, not a buildup of Am Yisrael. But this is worse than anything else. Why? Because the past destructions, the past catastrophes brought atonement to Am Yisrael because it was coming from the non-Jews. But this, this is coming in the hands of the Jewish heretics, says Rav Wasserman. And it's a great rebuke and accusation on the whole Am Yisrael, which gives them millions, while at the same time the Torah gets only pennies. See, all of these people, these Zionists, these heretics, these uh, false teachers, they're not doing things for free. To become a person that's as well known as Goldberg, as a uh, Weinberger, as a uh, 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 the uh, Manis, all of the Drokasuta, all of these people, Dweki Machimo, Merdevis, all of these people, it's not for free. It costs a lot of money to do that. It costs a lot of money to build such an empire. Where does that money come from? People donate to them, people gift it to them, people pay them. And that's what Rav Wasserman says. You're giving those Reshaim, those wicked people, those anti-Torah people, those enemies of the Torah people, you're giving them money while to the real Torah, the real Torah gets pennies in comparison to these people. And that's one of the things that's going to be a case against all of those wealthy people that donate and pay and reward and gift and whatever way support these wicked people. The amount of genom that they're going to get as a result of their donations will likely be even worse than the genom they're going to get for their own actions. Meaning, their own sins of doing all types of bad things is obviously going to get punishment. Okay, there's no such thing as a uh, sin with no punishment. Everybody has to pay the bill. Anyone says that a Kadosh Baruch is just going to let things go, gets an extra punishment for having a chutzpah of thinking that Hashem is going to forget something or just completely ignore it. Everyone has to pay the bill. That's just the reality unless we do tshuva. 
if you do tshuva, Bezat Hashem, you arrive there with a clean slate. Alvai, we all do that. But the point being is, is that each person makes sins, and each person has the bill to pay. But the people that support the Mirbises of the world, the Dweks of the world, the Goldberg, or Ephraim Goldbergs of the world, the, uh, the, uh, uh, all of these uh, Manus Friedman, Weinberger, all of these Rashaim that we have exposed and have shown time and time again that they're bad people. Or not, let's not forget, Dennis Prager, one of the biggest destructions to Am Yisrael in the last 30 years. Every single person that donates, gifts, pays, does business with those people will get a bigger punishment for that donation, for that gift, for that money, than even their own sins that they've made themselves. Why? Because while you made a single sin by eating something non-kosher or doing this or doing that, it was limited to you. But when you gave money to Manis, when you gave money to Weinberger or Goldberger or any of these people, what you ended up doing is you enabled them to cause the public to go against the Torah. You enabled Goldberg to run a synagogue with a thousand families and have an active parking lot right next to the shul on Shabbat where you have over 200 cars driving to the shul on Shabbat and no one says a single word. Why? There's even a few guys over there working at the parking lot, at the at parking uh, lot right next to the shul. Who are those people? They're employees of the synagogue, the Boca Raton synagogue. And no different with Manus and all of these other people. When you donate to those people, when you help those people, you become partners in all of their crimes. And the amount of damage that a person brings themselves oh what what a damage it's going to be what a punishment they're going to get and unfortunately sometimes these well-meaning young people interview these people and 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 highlight them and publicize them even further and they too become partners in the crime that will come out of those people as a result of your publicity and that's what happens but as i said nobody's innocent nobody's innocent why if you highlighted those people if you donated to those people if you did something to help those people there's a reason why the heavenly bed dean allowed you to do it you did something wrong in order to inherit something bad and it's time to do tshuva if you want the tshuva is always available as long as you're alive but once the clock runs out there's nothing any of us can do for ourselves anymore. Now, here we see that Rav Wasserman is bringing the same fire as he has in the past, and we're going to continue it. To establish firmly the Torah schools is an admirable deed. You'll see, Baruch Hashem, Jewish communities all over the U.S. and different parts of the world are only called Jewish communities if there is a Jewish school. Why? The Rambam Paskins Lalacha, that if there's no Jewish school, there's no right for the city to exist. Meaning, there is no Jewish community, the city might as well be destroyed. There's no such thing as a Jewish community without Jewish schools. You have to have Jewish schools. Why? Because the whole merit of the world runs off of the Torah of children. The Torah of children brings a lot of merit to the world. So to build a school for kids, for Jewish kids, is a very, very praiseworthy thing. So Torah schools are set up in all these different communities. Of course, today is even more than it was 80 years ago at the time of Rav Wasserman, who himself had in Baranovich over 400 students, who he took care of like they were his own sons. Torah schools are set up, but with a slight difference, he says. Says all these communities in America, in England, in uh, France, in all these different places, they have schools, they're building schools. There's always one or two wealthy guys in different communities. They want to put their name on a building or they want to donate and they want to, they want to have a school. Schools, usually, not necessarily the most difficult thing to, to raise money for if you're an active money raiser and you know people and so on. You can do it. But he says the schools are being set up. These so-called Torah schools are being set up in his day. But there's a 
slight difference slight difference what's the slight difference instead of teaching Torah in these Torah schools they teach the denial of the Torah they teach the opposite of the Torah they call it a Torah school but like this school in New York that I spoke to the principal wicked wicked man who calls himself a Chabad rabbi has an atheist as one of the teachers in a yeshiva has an atheist an atheist as a teacher in what's called the yeshiva or some of these other schools that I've spoken to where they have Christian missionaries working in a Jewish school not all schools are bad surely there are some good ones that I've met and surely there's going to be good ones that will be built in the future but nonetheless there's a lot more bad than there is good a lot more bad than there is good that's just the reality and anyone that knows the school system knows this to be the truth easiest way to do it is look the products look at the products look at the society today look at how the kids are most kids graduate yeshiva graduate these Jewish schools with no intention whatsoever of continuing their Jewish studies or even their religiosity especially if you look at the modern Orthodox schools there's almost a hundred percent failure ratio in the modern Orthodox schools what's a hundred percent failure ratio almost a hundred percent of the kids are not going to be religious I have one kid that went to the school by Ephraim Goldberg he's not a kid anymore he's an adult he says he was he was there he grew up there and he says he is the last person in his entire graduating class that is observing Shabbat today only seven or eight years after graduation one kid left one kid everybody else not keeping nothing they call him rabbi because he keeps Shabbat and this unfortunately Kabutai, is what happens in all these schools that teach things that are antithetical to the Torah teach things that are not 100 percent what the Torah said they teach modern things they teach things that are foreign to the Torah world one of these things we'll go into in a second and te- instead of teaching Torah these so-called schools teach the denial of the Torah the teachers take care though to make sure that all of their teachings come with the purity of the Hebrew language what is it what, why is why is Wasserman mentioning this little extra fact that these teachers that are teaching heresy but they make sure to teach it to you with an emphasis on the Hebrew language Ivrit why because for people that don't know any better if you hear something in Hebrew it gives it authenticity it gives it a sense of legitimacy it gives it a sense of value a sense of, of of something that is of old and the reality is Rabotai the Hebrew language is not as important as thing as people think it should be for a Jew it's you should know Hebrew it's good to know Hebrew but it should not be your priority priority of every single Jew is to know or non-Jew is to know what the Torah says why because that's what's going to determine whether you're going to act in accordance to the Torah or not in accordance to the Torah to know what the Torah says and to follow it is going to determine whether you go to heaven or not to know Hebrew on the other hand there are many heretics there are many wicked people that know Hebrew better than you and I these messianic reshaim wicked people from one from Israel if you hear their their Hebrew they're like professors they know Hebrew extremely well it's their mother tongue but their genome will never end the world will end and their genome will not end and unfortunately Rabotai many people think that by knowing Hebrew that makes you more inclined to understand what the Torah says but it's completely false why because the Torah's Hebrew and modern Hebrew are practically two different languages even though they're both called Hebrew because the holy tongue of the Torah in many cases it has words that are the opposite of modern Hebrew because Ben Yehuda when he created the modern day Hebrew he intentionally and some of the followers intentionally made certain words that are the opposite of the biblical meaning because they weren't uh, exactly pro-Torah and the reality is that many times people learn 
Hebrew, thinking that, oh yeah, so therefore if I learn Hebrew from uh, some course on the internet or something else, I will be able to read the Torah and translate it and interpret it the way I want. No, Habibi. Even if you knew Hebrew and you knew Biblical Hebrew, you're still not qualified to interpret what the Torah says. You have to look at the sages from the day you were born until the day you die. You have to look at what Rashi says, you have to look at what Ramban says, and you look at what all of the other Mefarshim say. Why? To interpret the Torah requires a person to be an extraordinary Talmud Chacham, not an extraordinary uh, uh, student of the Hebrew language. Many times, if anyone knows the history of the Jewish people, you'll see that some of the most important books in history were not even written in Hebrew. A large portion of the Talmud, our oral Torah, is written in Aramaic. The Rambam wrote Mishneh Torah in Arabic. The Ben Ishchai wrote his work in Arabic. Is a special book that he wrote for women that now has been translated to, uh, to, uh, to English. But this book he wrote intentionally in simple Arabic. Not just Arabic, in simple Arabic because he writes in the, in the uh, introduction of the book which is highly recommended to all women to read. For all women to read. He wrote, he wanted to write this book in simple Arabic. Why? So the women understand what is being said because that's the important part. What does the Torah say? Allowed, not allowed. Go, don't go. Yes, no. And so on and so forth. Many people think that knowing Hebrew is important and I have one guy that I know years ago wanted to uh, do a lot of good things, convert, do this, do that, so on and so forth, but had a special uh, affinity for the Hebrew language. Well, he learned quite a bit about the Hebrew language, but unfortunately he abandoned the Torah. So when he goes up to Shemaim, if he stays that way, they'll say, so what did you do in your life? I learned Hebrew. No, no. What did you do in your life? I learned Hebrew. We don't really care if you learned Hebrew. What did you do in your life? How many mitzvot? How many sins? How many mitzvot? What did you do? A person answers in Shemayim that they know Hebrew is not going to help them. Surely, it's good. It's recommended to learn Hebrew, but only after you know enough to be righteous. You know enough to be righteous, meaning know enough Torah to be righteous. Know enough about the mitzvot to be righteous. You're not going to discover that by simply learning the language. But the heretics will often make a big deal of the Hebrew language. And that's why usually you'll see the people that are on the heretical side make a big deal about the Hebrew language. You say, oh, look, what? You don't know Hebrew? Ah, so you probably don't know anything then. If you don't know Hebrew, therefore you don't know any Torah. Complete nonsense. Many of the sages wrote their Torah in different languages. The Me'am Lo'ez was written in Ladino originally then then it was translated to english and only then translated to hebrew that was the third translation book one of the most famous series of books by arav kuli Allah love shalom from written over 300 years ago has a compilation of all of the midrashim extraordinary knowledge that he knew by heart it's amazing that a human being that lived in this world knew all of this torah it's uh, even with a computer you can't do what he did in the ma'am Lois. The point being, Rabotai is much Torah was written in different languages and in different uh, different countries. But yet, the heretics will always make a big deal of the Hebrew language. Why? Because it's easy to fool people. It's easy to fool people when you speak Hebrew or you say words in Hebrew. It sounds like you know what you're talking about. Even these Christian missionaries fool their crowd by pretending to know Hebrew and say, Yeah, I learned Hebrew and they make a bunch of sounds. Sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's completely incorrect, sometimes complete mispronunciation, sometimes not, but for sure, always misinterpreted. Always. Even if they read it 100% right, always misinterpreted. Why? Because they're interpreted according to their heart, they're interpreted according to their agenda, not according to what the opinion of the Torah is. That opinion of the Torah only comes with scholarship and good deeds in accordance with the Torah, not with heresy and idolatry. But many times you'll see the haters of the truth go against anyone who doesn't speak Hebrew as well as them, or worse yet, sometimes you'll see 
a, uh, uh, someone saying, no, well, he doesn't uh, know Aramaic. Oh, you know Aramaic? Ah, you're not even a Talmud Chacham, you're not a scholar, you're not nothing, you don't know anything. Why? They're making a big deal of the language. They're making a big deal of the language. But is the language the, the, the most important? Here, Rav Wasserman says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's just a tool that we can use in order to do a lot of different things, but it's definitely not part of the foundational principles of Judaism. But yet, a lot of people are fooled by it. So has the Torah been changed. So has the Torah has been changed because of this heretical teachings, because of these heretical teachings being taught with people with a slick tongue. These places of Torah, Rav Wasserman says, have been changed into a place of missionaries, he says. A place of missionaries, a bet mission. He calls the modern schools that say that they're places of Torah. Because they tell the kids, put on tefillin in the morning. Put on a kippah. We're going to give you kosher food. But yet at the same time, teach you things that are 100% against the Torah. He's not just talking about atheist, Zionist, and Christians. He's talking about people that call themselves rabbis call themselves even orthodox that's who he's talking about how do i know you'll see what he says now it's the duty of the congregation to take a rabbi who will be a true guide yet those yet they choose rabbis who are ignorant of the shulchan aruch and yet more sufficiently versed with the modern national literature here this is an extraordinary two points that we need to understand first and foremost Rav Wasserman says is that it's the obligation of each and every single Jewish community whether that Jewish community is in Brazil Uruguay New York Syrian community the uh, uh, Litvish community Chabad community the Breslov community Ashkenazi Sephardi whatever it is each and every single community wherever you are it is your obligation not anybody else's obligation and not even the rabbi's obligation it is your obligation to go and get the best possible rabbi money can buy what rabbi is that a rabbi who's going to be the guide for each and every single one of you to heaven you are all going to have to depend on this rabbi to get you to heaven if you don't have a rabbi that's going to get you to heaven you my friend are not fulfilling your obligations as a jew simple if the community does not get the best possible rabbi to help each person and each family to get to heaven they're not fulfilling their obligation now people think oh yeah well it's everyone would want to be a rabbi thinking that to be a real rabbi is like some type of honor there's nothing further from the truth to be a real rabbi that actually helps people is a burden among burdens but nonetheless a necessary burden why you have to constantly tell people what they're doing wrong and you constantly have to help them even if they don't want to listen to you the reality is is it's a very very difficult job why because you have to be available even when you don't want to you have to be cordial even when you can't you have to be all types of things you have to wear a million different hats but nonetheless you have to tell people the truth even when it hurts many times people say oh yeah rabbi can you be my rabbi i say listen me being your rabbi is not my decision it's not my decision what do you mean i want to ask you, you want to be my rabbi? it's not my decision well, whose decision is it it's your decision for me to be your rabbi or for anyone to be your rabbi that's your decision why is it your decision because to make somebody your rabbi means that you believe with perfect faith in our torah that the words of this rabbi are the words of akadosh baruch Hu himself not his own opinion not his own feelings but that means that whatever he says it's as if god said it himself which means you cannot go right or left from what your rabbi said he says go you go he says don't go you don't go he says Allah is like this you do Allah is like this even if you don't like it 
That's what a rabbi is. The reality is, Rabbi, many people have too big of an ego to even have a rabbi. Why? They'll say, yeah, you're my rabbi, my dear rabbi, love my rabbi, 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 a year, two, five, six, ten, whatever, however many years or months. They'll donate, they'll do nice things, they'll have dinners, ask for help, and so But then one day comes and Mr. Mr. Jones over there that says, my dear rabbi, here is the rabbi, say something that's not to his likings. The rabbi is against Zionism. The rabbi is against Whigs. The rabbi is against all types of heretical teachings. The rabbi is against another rabbi that he likes to hear from, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden is like, rabbi, listen, I have to disagree with you there. The second you say, Rabbi, I have to disagree with you there. He is no longer your rabbi. Why? You're not allowed to disagree with your rabbi. It's like saying, Hashem, I don't agree with you. Now you're going to say, oh, that's extreme. What, rabbis became God? No. The rabbis are servants of God, which means that if he's your rabbi, you believe that everything he says and everything he's guiding you is in accordance with what God said. So to say you disagree with him, that means you disagree with God. Rabotai Karim, the Gemara doesn't say it once or twice, but many times. Fear your rabbis like you fear God. Why? Because if he's really a real rabbi, that means he's telling you what God is trying to tell you. But if you feel that you have the luxury of making a choice to listen or not to listen, that means you do not have a rabbi. You have somebody that can tell you things. You have perhaps a friend, a colleague, a chavruta that you learn with. You do not have a rabbi. A rabbi is someone you listen to despite what he says whenever he says it. And that, Rabbi Taikrim, is very hard to find. Very hard to find people like that. But nonetheless, it's even harder to find people that are willing to make somebody a rabbi. You know how many times my dear rabbi said things to me that I don't exactly want to do, I don't exactly agree with. But Ishtabach Shimolad, we've passed every single test that we've been given and we continue and we do and we do and we disagree and we do and we do and eventually we see he was right anyway and we were wrong. But nonetheless, even when we thought we were right and he's wrong, we still did it. Why? That's what a rabbi is. That's the secret to success. But if a person thinks that they have the luxury to choose what to listen to, and if it's not this, then I'll listen to something else, and I'll listen to that one, I'll listen to that one, a little bit of everything, like a shakshuka, you have shakshuka. You don't have a rabbi. You have salad. You don't have a rabbi. So to actually make somebody a rabbi, it's not the rabbi's choice, because quite frankly, anyone that has the capacity to be a rabbi doesn't want to be a rabbi. Why? Who wants that responsibility of people bothering him all day? Let me learn, leave me alone. Who wants to want to have the responsibility to, to make sure that people know everything they need to know? Because if they don't know it, it's his fault. If they don't know it, it's his fault. He was supposed to teach them. Rabotaya Karim. That's the reality. Many people could be your fans, many people could be your friends, but people to make you a rabbi few and far in between why people have too much of an ego people have too much of an ego people like to shop around people like to hear what they want to hear but they'll say you are the rabbi i'll support you i'll help you i'll do this this and that so long as you're saying things that does not disagree with their logic but the second you disagree okay listen listen it happens you know we'll we'll you know, we'll talk another time. We'll find another thing. We will agree to disagree. Something like that. So that's why Rabbi To make somebody a rabbi is a decision of the student, not the rabbi. Because the rabbi, quite frankly, doesn't want to do it, but he does it because it's a necessary thing to do. In a place that there's no leader, you be the leader. And one of the main things that happens to many people is that they end up picking the wrong rabbis because the people that are the wrong rabbis, they always want to be the rabbis. They always want to be famous rabbis. They always want to be popular rabbis. They'll go to all your weddings and your bar mitzvah and your bat mitzvah and your brit milahs and your, uh, your housewarming party and your other party and your get-together party and your birthday party and your kid's birthday party and the alvaya, the, the funeral for your dog and the anniversary of your cat and they'll be at every one of your places. Why? 
for them it's work for them it's socializing for them that's what they want to do they want to be with the crowd every night they're out every single night they're at some simcha if your rabbi is every simcha he's not a rabbi he's your friend he's your colleague he's somebody that's a employee of yours because he's probably getting paid quite a bit from you but he's definitely not your rabbi why if you see your rabbi that often if you can pick up the phone at any moment and your rabbi is going to pick answer you and you can have a conversation with him that means the rabbi doesn't have any time to learn Torah. the rabbi is too busy socializing that's not a rabbi that's not a rabbi your rabbi goes to all your social events it's not a rabbi it's another friend that happens to be religious but he has his job as being a rabbi that's all it is he's not your rabbi your rabbi has to be focused on either learning Torah spending a little time with his family or helping the public that's it nothing else to do in the world that's the job of rabbi There's nothing gra- glamorous about it but the rabbi is constantly out he's constantly about I don't have time to be a rabbi why a rabbi is someone that is constantly dealing with issues constantly and there's no shortage unfortunately of issues of problems that people have marriage problems children problems medical problems financial problems and so on and so forth if you're out and about going and uh, partying when do you have time to help the people you say no no I'm helping them while I'm out okay so when you have time to learn Torah when you have time there's no time level time there's no time even if it's a small community of 50 60 people people think oh no it's a small community there's no such thing no such thing everybody that wants to be a rabbi will have an endless amount of issues to deal with and that's why Rabotai you see many times that the rabbis will have people ask for help need guidance and so on but it's a revolving door the guy that got help for the last few years no longer comes the guy that got help for the last five years no longer comes the the woman that uh, got uh, guidance for the last few months for the last few years no longer comes but somebody else comes and two or three other new people come why because they got help as long as the help agreed with their own logic and their own system and their own mentality but the second it disagreed with their desire with their likings with their objection with their objective that's it they switch to a different rabbi what's the other rabbi a rabbi that agrees with their current status and that's what happens many times which means they never had a rabbi but the poor rabbi he acted like a rabbi he did what he could either way rabbi is the decision of the public of whether they'll have a rabbi that's the Mish- that's why the mishnah in avot says aselecharav aselecharav means make yourself a rabbi it doesn't say make yourself a student it doesn't say that it says make yourself a rabbi where do you make yourself a rabbi make yourself a rabbi go find a talmid chacham and listen to everything that he says so much so that you'll be scared not to listen to him why scared brought this and it was published recently in his newsletter brought this story to the public one time where the Mishnah in Avot chapter 5 says that that there's a special reward for people that are involved in Kiruv that benefit the public with the Torah what is this special merit with this special benefit that sin doesn't come upon their hand so what does this really mean sin doesn't come upon their hands it means Rabotai, that the Chachamim discuss it and debate it and say that if a person is publicizing the Torah for the right reason he's publicizing the Torah for the right reason he's not doing it for the sake of uh, making money even if he does make money but nonetheless doesn't do it for money he doesn't do it for power even if he gets power that's power is being given to him by Hashem he's not doing it for reputation even if he has a good reputation he's not doing it for that he's doing it for the right reason and he fulfills the Torah himself and he does whatever he can to help people and spread the Torah everywhere Akadosh Baruch Hu will give him a special protection that the uh, traditional sins of the public that happen different mistakes that happen where you eat something and then find out that the chef made a mistake and it's really not kosher all types of things like that Hashem will protect them from those types of sins he won't protect them from intentional sins like meaning for example if the guy wants to commit adultery or do something else he'll be able to do it but the traditional things that are day to day to day opportunities of the satan to make us fall Hashem will protect them from those things why because he's genuinely spreading the Torah and sharing it and he becomes a what's called a mezakeh rabim benefits the public with his Torah same thing goes with someone that supports it also has that special uh, uh that special merit and that special gift that Hashem gives him in this world but a person that is spreading Torah 
for his own sake in order to receive honor in order to receive money he's only doing it to get money he's only going to give that lecture if you pay him a bunch of money he's only going to go there if you publicize everything in a in a uh, and, and you give him a certain notoriety he's not going to do it if you bring the people but he's not going to have a you know he's he's only doing it for honor and for 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 uh, for money and reputation and so on that's what he's doing it for doesn't get that benefit but even more so if that person even if he shares the torah and he shares good torah but he himself does not dedicate himself to the torah he doesn't dedicate himself to learning torah he doesn't dedicate himself to fulfilling the torah he also loses that protection also loses that protection it's a very very serious thing so to get that protection Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to make sure that the person is himself following the torah but what does it mean if somebody is following the torah following the Torah means that the person has to have a rabbi that tells him what does the Torah say that if that person says right you go right if that person says left you go left and there was a couple of people there was a couple of people that were doing good things they were publicizing the Torah they published the Talmud a few hundred years ago and new edition of the Talmud and they got the rabbis to sign with them an agreement that they're supportive that they're going to take on this huge uh investment that the uh these publishers are going to take this huge investment and they're going to publish the talmud but they're going to have rights to publish the talmud for the next 10 years no one else is allowed to publish the talmud and the rabbis saw that this is for the benefit and the merit of am israel they said yeah you're right no one else is allowed to publish the talmud and that's what happened and they published and they published and they invested a lot of money and within several years they sold everything that they published it was a very very successful but there was still a few years left in the 10-year agreement that they had with the rabbis but they ran out of books so a couple of other people came and said listen we want to publish and we're going to publish the talmud and they came to these printers and they said we're going to publish it i said no no no, you can't publish it what do you mean we, uh, we're going to publish it we have to we have to get the talmud out there he goes yeah but we have an agreement great you have an agreement but you're not publishing anything you ran out that's it you finished we're going to publish it. No, we're going to take you to Bed Din. They went to Rabbi Akiva Iger. Rabbi Akiva Iger, Allah wa Shalom, was Kodesh Kodeshim. He was in his 70s at the time. Older man, but nonetheless, still sharper than he ever was before because the Gemara says, Chachamim, they become sharper over time, not like uh, the ignorant that become duller over time. So they came to him and Rabbi Akiva Iger, Paskin, yes, they're right, since you've sold everything that you printed you don't have any other copies they have a hundred percent right to publish a uh the talmud from now on even though the agreement has not run out because it's for the sake of the torah itself there's no reason for us to delay it for several years uh just because we originally signed 10 years so they could do it now although these original printers were decent people were good people they disagreed they disagreed with Rabbi Akiva Igel, the Gdola Do and word got around that they said listen we think that Rabbi Akiva Igel made a mistake Gdolado made a mistake not only made a mistake perhaps it's uh, something that would happen is that because he's only older he's in his 70s really he's being influenced by his younger son who's really in control of things and that influences decision he really can't make up his own mind sounds familiar doesn't it what's happening with Rav Kanievsky Rav Kanievsky sheikh yeah many times people say oh no it's not really Rav Kanievsky it's his grandson because Rav Kanievsky can't really handle himself all types of nonsense well for all of those people that like to say stupid things like that about Rav Kanievsky or any other Rav that they're older and they can't handle things and someone else is making decisions for them and they're easily to be uh be fooled listen to this story it's verified verified Rabotai Karim it's in history those people that were other than this issue were righteous they published the Talmud good people they said a bad word about Rabbi Akiva Iger Rabbi Akiva Iger heard this he allowed himself he allowed himself to get angry for the sake of the Torah and he said this is not only a desecration of the Torah of, of myself my name but the Torah itself I care less about myself but you are insulting my dear son 
And you are insulting the Torah that I learned, not me, the Torah that I learned. And he goes to the Aron Kodesh, and people saw this. And he says, Ribono Shel Olam, you may want to forgive them for what they have done to my son and myself, but do not forgive them for what they did to you. And as you would have it, Rabotai Kareem, something changed in the world that moment. A decree was paskined, and all of a sudden, the evil goyim that hated Jews at the time, the Russians, decided that they're going to make these people their, uh, their sacrifice. They arrested them under false accusations for different reasons, completely unrelated, and sentenced them to death for something they didn't even do. After a lot of pleading and so on, they said, listen, we'll give you a opportunity to live. How do you live, these two brothers? How are you going to live? You have to pass the these lines, these uh, 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 lines of soldiers on both sides, tunnel of soldiers on both sides that have bats in their hands. You have to pass it several times. But you have to get like 1,500 smashes with the bat. If you stay alive after, then you can go free. And these two guys understood that this decree is from heaven and it's because they made a mistake. The mistake of a lifetime by going against the rabbi, going against the Gdol Ador, Rabbi Akiva Iger. No different than the Gdol Ador of today like Arav Kanievsky or other Gdolim. And they took it and they understood it's their mistake and this is the decree from Shemaim and so let, let it be. And they took it with love and they went through it. And within moments, the first brother got smashed over the head and the keeper fell and he refused to move forward. And they continued hitting him until one of the Russians hit him in the eye and blew up his face, blew up his eye. And he continued refusing to move forward without his keeper, without his skull cap. When one of the other Russians saw that this guy is not moving and saw the reason why he put it on him and let him continue moving and miraculously they both survived but of course with damages that are unquantifiable why they went against the rabbis all the time. they went against the rabbis to go against the gedolei ador is the stupidest thing a person can do it's better to commit suicide then to go against the Gdolei Ador, to go against Da Torah, even if it's not from Gdolei Ador, even from the local rabbi, Talmit Chacham, to go against him, to go against him, it's better to commit suicide. Why? Because in essence, it's better to commit physical suicide than spiritual suicide. But that's unfortunately what happens today, Rabbi Karim. Many times people say, no, he's my rabbi, he's my rabbi, until he says something you don't like, and so, so long, rabbi. That's why it's important for a person to know. Rabbi is someone you listen to everything as if it's Moshe Rabbeinu. That's a rabbi. Now we continue with the second point. Rav Wasserman says that despite this obligation that people have to bring the best rabbi that money can buy, the best rabbi that they can possibly get, Communities back then, and needless to say today, choose rabbis who are ignorant of the Shulchan Aruch. Don't know the Shulchan Aruch, don't know anything. But they're extremely well versed in the national literature. What is this like? This Rabotai is like the clown Dweck in England who has a book club in his Jewish community, in his synagogue that he started, a book club, but not a book club of learning Sifrei Kodesh, holy books, no, learning Musa, learning Halakha, no, no, what, what a club? He started a book club with his own recommendation of books, starting with a book called Catcher in the Rye. Catcher in the Rye, or The Greatest Show on Earth, Greatest Show on Earth is a book that he recommended. What is this book, Greatest Show on Earth? In the year 2015, 
he had a whole sh a whole meeting about this book that everybody had to read in his in his uh, book club in his synagogue called the greatest show on earth written by richard dawkins one of the most well-known atheist anti-torah people that are alive today the same guy that unfortunately helped lord Sachs desecrate the torah by mocking the torah on stage in front of a live audience but this dockings is a rasha mirusha that's unchangeable and instead of mocking him instead of going against him what do they do they celebrate him by buying his book and reading it under the leadership of dwick joseph dwick if that wasn't bad enough he recommends catcher in a ride to start off to kick off the uh the book club catcher in a ride well-known book written in the 1950s was originally supposed to be an adults only book why adults only because the book discusses story of a teenage rebellion that promotes promiscuity drugs drug use all types of awful and forbidden behavior according to the jew so much so rabotai this book created so much tension in its time that when the murderer assassin mark david chapman assassinated the uh, famed musician john lennon they found on him a copy of the book catcher in the rye and in it he wrote from holden caulfield to holden caulfield this is my statement who's holden caulfield the main actor or figure in the book catcher in the rye a book that promotes promiscuity sexuality drug use degenerate behavior that is what joseph dwick recommends for his community to read in his book club in january of 2015 not too long ago but yet he is praised he is honored and he gets paid a million and a half dollars a year to destroy his community this is what we have today Rabotai. nothing has changed from the time of Rab Wasserman you ask him a book you ask him about the catcher in a rye or the greatest show on earth or all types of other heretical books he can tell you and he can quote you give you different things by heart I know somebody that was very close to Ephraim Goldberg for many years he says you don't understand this Ephraim Goldberg is a bookworm so oh he learns a lot of Torah I don't know about how much Torah he learns, but you go to his house, you're gonna find an endless amount of books. He reads like a, a book a day, a book a week, or some crazy amount of books, secular books, and that's what you'll see. They publish his a uh, uh, his sources. His, they call it source sheet. It's uh, of all of his lectures. There's not a single lecture that he has, or a single blog that he has, that does not mention at least one or two secular sources people think oh that's good he's showing how this is modern and how this is no no he's not showing things like let's show a proof of how the torah is applicable here and there no he's using them as the proof them as the source them as the scholars in line and in essence in uh uh equal uh, equal status to our sages look at the uh, blogs he writes and the other awful things that he says constantly quoting he quotes more of the secular writers than he does of Chazal but that's the reality of today and it's nothing new the Wasserman says that this is something that existed even in this time before the Holocaust and we saw how that ended this is the outcome of Wasserman says of fulfilling the mitzvot without the Torah you go and you say listen let's all pray okay so we'll pray no no let's all go pray at the beach why why are we praying at the beach the Knesset get burned down no we're praying so we have a nice view so we can look at the sky who says you're even allowed to look at the sky while you pray well what, it's not good who says you're allowed to look at the sky while you pray what are you gonna have images of God not allowed oh I didn't know oh the rabbi said it's okay yeah your rabbi doesn't know anything and that's the danger of 
If you go to a rabbi who doesn't know Shuchan Aruch, you are putting yourself in danger. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Simple things that are done wrong on a daily basis. You go to the Shuchan Aruch. You go to Alachot Brachot. Siman Nun Hei. Siman Nun Hei. Now this you also find in the the Chafetz Chaim's Mishnah Bura. Nonetheless, in Lachot Brachot, talking about the Lachot of Kaddish. Kaddish. You go, you pray, say Kaddish, right? Well, Rabbi Tayyikarim, it says in Siman Nunhei 55, in a Ot Bet, second section, right in the beginning. Of the siman. Imit chilo mar kadish o kedusha be'asara ve'atzu mikzatan. Gomrim, gomrim oto a kadish o ta kedusha shitchil. Vu shinit shinistayu ruban. Says if they start saying kadish in bichnes you have minyan, you have ten or more people there, and someone says kadish. As we say in every prayer multiple times, or during the Amidah, they say the Kedusha, which is a repetition of the, uh, the Amidah. After the first couple of prayers, there's a section where it says the Kedusha, where the whole community, the whole Kila has to say uh, Hashem's name, holy, 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 and so on and so forth. These are specific sections that are sanctifying a Kedush whose name. It's the, in essence, the highlight of the whole prayer. Now, if during that time that someone is saying Kaddish, some people left the shul, he has a phone call, he has a meeting, he has a this, he has a that, they left the shul, you continue doing the Kedusha, you continue completing the Kaddish, so long as there are at least six people. At least six people, meaning there's the majority of a minyan. A minyan is ten people. Minimum 10 people. If you have more than 10 people, then it doesn't matter. People leave. It's not, uh, it's not good, but nonetheless, it doesn't really affect anything. The main thing is, is if it goes down, you're not allowed to say the Kedusha or take out the Sefer Torah or say Kaddish unless there is a Minyan, 10 people that are Shomre Shabbat. If there's less than 10 people that are Shomre Shabbat, you're not allowed to say Kaddish, you're not allowed to take out the Sefer Torah, which means that a lot of these shuls that have a community, a Kilah, that where most people are not keeping Shabbat, but they still say Kaddish, they still take out the Sefer Torah, the whole community is sinning because it's all taking Hashem's name in vain. But let's assume you have one of the kosher communities where you least have 10 Shomre Shabbat, but several of them leave during this specific time for different reasons. As long as you have at least six, you complete the Kaddish, you complete saying it, or the Kedusha, you complete saying the Kedusha. Obviously, if there's more, nine people leave, you don't, you stop. You're left by yourself, you stop. But the point is that you continue so long as they, uh, there's at least six. Then you go in the same section and you look at the commentary by the Rama. Rama, the Gdola of the Ashkenazi world, at the time of the Rabbi Yosef Karo, and he says the following. Either way, know that this is a sin to leave the shul during that time that someone is saying Kaddish or that there's Kedusha. It's a sin. Know this. What kind of sin? Is this like sin like Hashem is saying, no, come on, what are you doing to me? It's not nice, Habibi. Come on, do better next time. Is it that kind of sin or is it like Genom, you're the word? Like, what is it? Like, give us a little bit of taste, right? That's not just from Musar books. This is Alacha. This he paskins la alacha. This is what it is, Rabotai. Know that this is a sin. Umikol makom averai latzet. Ve'alem ne'emar ve'ozve Hashem yichalu. Hashem yishmor ve'yatzil. May Hashem help us and save us. Once we understand what he just said. The Ramah says here, know this, 
someone is saying Kaddish in your shul, and you decide you're going to go take a phone call, you're going to leave for different reasons, not because it's a life risk, but rather you just, ah, no, it's not a big deal. You leave. Hamas says it's a sin, but not just any sin. There's a verse written about those people that walk away from a Kaddish or a Kedusha. Needless to say, those people that talk in the middle of Kaddish or Kedusha. Same thing. Even worse, actually. The Shulchan Aruch says people that talk in Shul, there's, there's, there's no bigger sin than them. There's no bigger wicked people than these people. But nonetheless, the Hamas says, what is, what is this? He says it is written a verse about those people. Book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 28. Those that abandon God may be destroyed. The Ramaz says you leave the shul during Kaddish. You leave the shul during the Kedusha. You have inherited yourself. You have acquired yourself a special curse from a Kadosh Baruch Hu himself. To be destroyed and that he paskins la alakha it's not advice it's alakha if your rabbi doesn't know this and he doesn't tell the community any of this stuff which means that people walk in and out of the shul like it's a bus stop to train it's a subway during kaddish after this that no problem it's like you know automatic door no big deal that they're saying kaddish they talk during kaddish they talk during tusha they talk during amida kriyat torah no big deal and the rabbi never says it you do not understand what you are having here you are going to shul not to get blessed you're going to shul to get cursed if you are that person that's walking in and out better off you don't go to shul why who wants to go to shul to get cursed but not curse from people, curse from Hashem. To what? To be destroyed. You want to get blessing to say thank you to Hashem, do all types of things. Instead, a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, Hey, this is a nice verse for you. And this is not Musal. This is Allah. A person that doesn't know this, Abu Tayyib Karim, puts himself in great danger. Puts himself in great danger, Abu If you go further, Ilchot Kriyat Shema. In Siman Samech Aleph. He says, in a Siman Samech Aleph, in the uh, section Vav, talks about Kriyat Shema, talks about how a person needs to make sure to extend Yarich Badalet Shelaichad to uh, to make sure that uh, 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 to uh, when you get to the Dalit of the word Echad, which is the last means one, uh, the last word of Shema Israel, to extend that Dalit to say d- 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 d. it's the most important word in the entire Tefillah in the entire Shema Israel is that word Echad. Why Echad? If you make a mistake in the word Echad, and instead of Echad, you take away that little chupchik, that little tiny little line that's in the letter Dalit. You turn it into a resh. And instead of saying echad, it says acher. Acher means foreign, foreign God. Instead of saying, God, uh, here are uh, uh, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Here are Israel, our God, our God is one. You're saying our God is a foreign God. Somebody else is multiple gods, Shem Yishmo. So it's very important to ex- uh, accentuate the echad, the Dalit in echad. And Sami says, he says there are some that have the custom to, in order to accentuate this whole Shema Yisrael, to have more Kavana and so on, that they are learned enough and they know that to move their head in a certain direction and up, down, uh, and uh, to the four, uh, four corners of the world. Okay? Now, the Beretev commentary here, the Beretev says, make sure that the Torah 
דהרי דרכי האומרי. He says, make sure that if you're going to move your head when you're saying this Shema to have Kavana, if you don't know directions or you don't know what you're doing, don't do anything at all. Just say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, appropriate, right way with Kavana, don't do anything else. But if you're already going to be moving your head because you want to have all these different things, you better know what you're doing, he says. Why? If you don't do it the way it's supposed to be done, which is like a star. You're doing it a uh, front, sideways, back, right. Okay? Front, sideways, back, right. It's like it almost looks like a diamond. But if you're doing it front, back, right, left, he says, you, my dear friend, have just taken the most critical moment of the entire tefillah and have bowed to idolatry because you've just made with your head, with the tefillin on, a symbol of the of the Christian cross. The Satan entered your tefillah. Instead of bowing to Hashem, and how he is in control of the four corners of the world, he's the one and only, you have now made the symbol of the cross with your head, with the tefillin on, you, my friend, have a very serious problem. Now, if your rabbi doesn't know the halacha, it's not the end of the world, but if he sees or recommends for people to do, to move, and he, see, he sees you five years, ten years, and he sees you moving, and he doesn't recognize these basic things, guess what? His entire kila can be praying, and at the same time, all of their, all of the kohot, all of the power that's coming there is going to idolatry. Why? That's Allah. Not Musa. Allah. Rabotai Yekarim. The Chachamim, when they said it is, the onus is on you to bring a rabbi that's a Talmud Chacham to your community, where when he doesn't know something, he'll know where to look and where to find. And if he's unsure of something, he has a rabbi that he is going to ask for. Not a rabbi colleague, a rabbi that is like Moshe Rabbeinu to him. Not like these clowns where, listen, if my question is not big enough, I'm just going to ask my friends. I'm not going to ask my rabbi. No, there is no big or small questions. If you don't know, you ask your rabbi. If you don't know, and you don't know where to look, you don't know where to find, you don't have the books, and you have a community, you don't just ask your friend. You go to your rabbi. If he doesn't have that rabbi, Rabotai, you have a problem as a community. This is one guy at a so-called debate with him. Another rabbi about the whole issue of Gehenom and so on and so forth. He insisted it's 12 months. I brought him countless sources. It's not 12 months. And what did he say? Listen, I, 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 uh, I, I, you know, I disagree. I agree. Went back and forth. He, I don't think he knows how to speak Hebrew or know how to read Hebrew or really anything. So, but yet he wrote in Hebrew, but I don't think he knows how to read Hebrew because he didn't understand anything that we wrote him. But needless to say, his response ultimately was, listen, I don't think this is a big enough issue for me to go ask my rabbi. So I think I'm right over here and that's it. This is a dangerous person. Why? He does not have enough fear of the Almighty to know that we don't take such risks. We don't take such risks and say, no, I don't think this is a big enough issue. I'm just going to assume that I'm right. We don't do that. Why? You have a responsibility. But that's why Rav Wasserman says, instead of the people being focused on their rabbi's scholarship, and knowing how much Torah he knows, not how much secular books he knows. Instead of focusing on the rabbi that they have and how much Yirat Shemaim he has, and how he's dedicated to Torah, how he doesn't move an ounce, an inch from the truth, how he doesn't have time for the socializing, but only has time for the Torah and for the community. That's it. Instead of focusing on that, they focus on, is he friendly? Is he modern looking? Is he this? Is he that? That's what happens, Rabotai. That's what's called mitzvot without Torah. They have a shul. They have rabbis there, but they don't have any Torah there. Why? 
because they're electing, hiring, and bringing people based on the wrong qualifications. It's like hiring a CEO to run your company based on who his father is, based on who his uncle is, based on what school he went to, or based on what shoe size he has. None of those things are going to really tell you whether he's qualified for the job. The only thing that's going to tell you whether he's qualified to be a CEO, not a clerk, not an assistant, a CEO to run your company, is is experience. It's experience in a field of specifically what you're looking for, experience in leading. But if you're going to hire him based on a shoe size, you're going to hire him based on who his father is, you're going to hire him based on how much money he has, you, my friend, are asking for problems. Needless to say, community, if you're hiring him because he's a good speaker, you're hiring him because he's popular, you're hiring him because he's tall, short, ugly, fat, whatever it is, and not because of his scholarship and not because of his Yilat Shamaim, you are asking for trouble. That's what's happening in many communities where each person has money to buy multiple houses. But for whatever reason, they don't have money to bring Talmidei Chachamim and to have serious kolels in their communities. People tell you, listen, can you do this in this video? Sure. Are you going to donate for it or you just want us to do it uh, for free? Oh, well, you can't do it for free. Well, it costs money. There's employees to pay. There's uh, this and that. There's programming costs. There's this cost. There's all types of costs. Oh, no, no, no. Forget it then. Forget it. Oh, okay. So, so you, pretty much, if it's not free, you don't want to do it then. Oh, can I get some uh, cards? Can I get some CDs? Yeah, you can order on the website. Oh, you have to pay for those things? Well, somebody has to pay for them. Oh, you don't just get them and like give them out? For, like, yeah, technically we do give out a lot of stuff for free, but that's not exactly the idea here. I mean, if you donate and, 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 and you know, it's, it's, listen, it's not really a, like a savings account. Your donation is to help us do a lot of different things. It's not like to use it so you can just get stuff later on. It's not like a, like a little bank. Needless to say, if you don't donate and you still want to get free stuff, I mean, it's, it's not exactly, the, the, that's not the goal. Sure, we still give most of the stuff that we have for free, but if you're just looking for stuff for free, it's not a good, it's not, a, it's not exactly the best way to do things. Why? Because if I came to your company and I asked you for a bunch of free sandwiches, asked you for a free, bunch of free cars and free computers, what are you going to tell me? No, come on, Rabbi, this stuff costs money. Well, but you don't just give it away. You don't, you, don't, you don't just give your services away. You don't just give your products away. You don't just give your... No, no, you don't give it away. That's what happens all the time. People want the best, but they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to invest in it. And so therefore they settle. What do they settle for? Things that make sense to them. Things that appeal to them. The looks, the acts, the popularity, the uh, vocabulary, and so on and so forth. Hence the reason of why we have such a corrupted system. And these mitzvot, these mitzvot that are kept without Torah, Rav Wasserman says, are kept with enthusiasm and remarkable devotion. People are extremely devoted to their heretical teachings. They're extremely devoted to all these types of nonsense. You ask a bunch of people, listen, we have a Shiu Torah, you guys going to come? Ah, yeah, well, I'll, I'll try. Bleed that I'll come. You know, I won't make a vow, but I'll, I'll try to come. And maybe you'll get 50, 100 people, maybe 20 people, maybe five people. You tell them, listen, we have a Yom Ha'atzma'ut party, Israeli Independence Day party. 500 people show up and 200 of them are not even part of your community, but they want to come for the party. What is that symbolic of? Weak community. But nonetheless, it's everywhere. Everywhere. Why? People... Are not taking the Torah seriously enough. And this costs a lot. It costs a lot to not take this seriously enough. They think that they're saving by not investing into the Torah, but they don't realize that they're actually losing as a result of it. They're excited to do the mitzvot that don't have the Torah in it. Like it says in the uh, book of uh, Exodus, Chapter 32, verse 6, of Wasserman quotes, Surely they have risen early. They have corrupted. He brings the Pasuk. He brings the Pasuk where Am Yisrael was, went after the golden calf. It says, 
says they rose early the next day to offer a burnt offering to the golden calf. So comes the Gemara, the Yerushalmi, in Masichet Shkalim, chapter 1, Alachan number 1, says Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, all of their corruption was done Ba'ashkama. What's Ba'ashkama? Early, with alertness. That when it comes to the mitzvot, when it comes to doing good things according to the Torah, whether it's to donate money, or it's to pray, or it's to uh, do something for public good, or it's to learn, ah, yeah, I'm here, uh, and, you know, everybody's like dragging their feet, and you know, everybody feels like they have like water in their shoes, and they can barely show it up, and the crust is in their eyes, and they can't wait, oh, we're not finished yet, Rabbi? I mean, we've been here for a while already. Why? Everybody's like, can't, you know, they're getting there and can't wait to leave. But, Super Bowl party! Yeah, who's having it? You have it? You have it? Who's having it? You know, I'm going to have it in my house. Then we're going to go to your house. Then we're going to go house hopping. Ha, ha, ha. We're going to house hopping. That's what we're going to do, right? Yeah, yeah. High five, high five. That's what happens. With sins, alert, early, excited. Show up to shul, 7 o'clock in the morning to pray. Ah, Rabbi, it's early. But 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning to a flight that goes to some vacation, you're there at 4 o'clock in the morning just to make sure you don't miss the flight. You'll skip a night of sleep just to make sure you don't skip, you don't miss the flight. Rabotei Karim, I'm talking to all of us, myself included. It's just a reality. When it comes to sins, we are all alert we are all excited, but when it comes to mitzvot, we're dragging our feet. This is a problem we've had for countless years. This is a problem we've had for generations. And this is a problem that's highlighted in the modern mentality. What has resulted from these new mitzvot, these new laws? We've forsaken the law of our old rabbis, those lofty sages, says Rav Wasman. And God has given us other rabbis in quotations. Who are these other rabbis and, t- and teachers? Haman and his confederates, meaning Hitler and his followers, who teach us by the most modern of modern methods. They will continue to teach us until we throw off the false culture and enlightenment together. Then will peace come to Am Yisrael. You see, Rabotai Karim, the modern mentality and heretical behavior is not a new thing. It's not just today. It's something that has existed and it's something that has hounded us, tortured us, and brought us a lot of suffering as a people for many generations. In today's world, there's no shortage of false teachers that tell you that to learn about reward and punishment and about Gehenom is not a good thing and it's not recommended and it could depress you and it could do this to you. But the reality is if you look at the world, if you're saying, listen, what is Torah observant? You're not, no one's going to define, define Torah observant by someone that is modern. Rather, you're going to look at Rav Kanievsky or the, the Gdolim, the Tzadikim, those people that followed the entire Torah and toiled for it and so on. So, Everybody knows that there's, you can't compare your local, a uh, modern rabbi to the Gdoleado, the giants that are zealous, or even your uh, average Haredi rabbi. No one's going to say the modern guy is more religious than the Haredi guy. No one's going to say that. But yet people think, no, it doesn't matter, even though he is Haredi, he's ultra-Orthodox, and the other guy is modern, the other guy is reformed, the other guy is conservative, and there's a place for everyone. Everybody wants to say that. People think that they can go against the Shem by cutting his mitzvot, by shortchanging his Torah, by desecrating his Torah, but yet they're going to have the same reward. We're going to finish off with a section that I learned in the, with my Rav in Shara Bitachon in Chovot HaLevavot. Chovot HaLevavot is one of the most important sfarim in Judaism. Rabbeinu Bechaye Ben Pakuda written about 800 years ago, the originally written in Arabic, then Hebrew, and uh, obviously you have it in English too. 
and is Shar Abitachon, in the gate of Bitachon, trust in God, in chapter 3, in Akdama Revi'it, the fourth section, he says the following. A person should be exceedingly careful to make a great effort to fulfill what the Creator commends and requires of him in his service to carry out his commandments and to keep far from what he has forbidden him, just as he would like the Creator to agree to that for which he relies on him. In so many words, a person should do what he's obligated to do and stay away from sins just like he would he has to follow Hashem's ways because he wants Hashem to follow his desires, meaning that he gives him the rewards and panasa and, 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 and good health and so on and so forth. So just like you want Hashem to do all the things that you want him to do, you have to do all the things that Hashem wants you to do. Logic, right? Okay, so far so good. As our sages of blessed memory said, do his will like your will so that he will do your will like his will nullify your will before his will so that he will nullify the will of others before your will this is a mishnah in perkei avot chapter 2 mishnah number 4 anyone that wants to go into the extensive teaching of that particular mishnah that is in our perkei avot series which Baruch Hashem we have uh, usbs of and it's online for free and so on as it says in scripture in the sefer teilim in the book of Psalms, chapter 37, verse 3. Trust in God and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy steady support. And also in Echa, in Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 25, he brings, as you can see, sources, sources, sources. A book without sources is not Torah. God is good to those who hope for him, to the soul that seeks him. So, so far we've established the point that you have the responsibility to do all the mitzvot. What happens if you don't do it? What happens if you, can you still, if you're reformed, if you're conservative, if you're intermarried, if you violate Shabbat on purpose, if you are uh, modernizing the Torah and distorting it, if you are uh, simply don't care, if you're not modest, if you don't, what happens? Do you, can you still get like, you know, like on the good side of Hashem and like get everything okay and I'll just give you a pass? What is the Shara Bitachon? The, the, the rules that we know, the, the, the teachings that we know, the foundation of the teachings of Bitachon, one of the main sources of him is here. All of the teachers of Emunah and Bitachon that actually know a few real things have to know this book back and forth. This is like one of the most critical books of Emunah and Bitachon. So he told us, you have to do what Hashem says and stay away from what he didn't say. What if I don't do so much of what he says? What happens? We continue. If, however, one relies on the Creator while at the same time he rebels against him, how stupid is such a person? And this is what he says. How stupid? Sakhal. Sakhal means stupid. You have, you. Expect Hashem to do what you want Him to do while at the same time you're violating Shabbat, at the same time you are intermarried, at the same time you are uh, doing all types of sins intentionally, knowingly. Not like you're some clueless, you live in some, you know, uh, uh, zoo or something and your next door neighbor is a lion and you don't know that you're a Jew or even a human. No, you know that you're a Jew but you're not following the mitzvot and yet you expect Hashem to help you. You have a stamp, a certificate, it may arrive in the mail, of stupidity from one of the greatest sages of the last thousand years, Rabbeinu Bechaya ben Pakuda. And he says, How stupid is such a person? How weak is his mind and his intellect? For he can see that in human relationships, when an individual is charged with a certain responsibility by another person who either commands him to attend to one of his affairs or cautions him about something, and he violates this person's command, if word of his violation then reaches the one who commanded him, 
it will be the strongest reason for the cancellation of that for which he had relied on the other bottom line is you have an agreement with somebody listen you have to do certain things and then i'll pay you the million dollars okay great you decide to do nothing or better yet you decide to go and do things that hurt the guy that promised you a million dollars you have a brain to know that if he finds out or when he finds out that you have done things that either violate the agreement by not fulfilling what you were supposed to or worse yet by doing things that are against the agreement it's not such a huge insight to understand that for sure he's going to cancel the agreement he's surely not going to fulfill the agreement why you went against him you have to be a genius to figure that out so a person that realizes that this is the way of the world why is it so hard for them to understand that the reason why they have problems the reason why they suffer so much the reason why they're unhappy the reason why they can't find a wife or a husband the reason why they're depressed the reason why they lost their job the reason why somebody died the reason why is because Hashem is in essence not happy with them why is it so hard to understand that oh but we don't really know no we don't know for sure what is the reason why Hashem is punishing you specifically at that moment but we are obligated to use the brain that Hashem gave us to look and review our own actions. As the Gemara says, someone who sees on himself, someone who sees that he's getting suffering, start reviewing your actions. See what you're doing wrong. Start, don't ask your girlfriend. Don't ask your boyfriend. Don't ask the, uh, your, your parents. Look at yourself. What am I doing that's against the Torah? What does that have to, one thing have to do with the other? Well, if you are doing something against the Torah, for sure it is at least a very high possibility and likelihood that that's the reason why you're getting the suffering. Oh, it's not because maybe, no, no. If there's something for sure that you know that you're doing wrong against the Torah, for sure that's the reason why you're getting the suffering. So very high chance, very high chance, especially if you know that you're doing it oh but we're not sure we're not this well but if it it was a regular business deal with a regular person or a job or something else if they didn't deliver on the contract because they found that you were doing something against them you wouldn't think oh do they really know they don't know you wouldn't ask that why because it's common sense this is certainly true then of one of the rebels against God Rabbeinu Bechai says one who rebels against God and transgresses his statutes and commandments for which he promised reward and threatened punishment if this person relies on God he ho- his hopes will be dashed meaning you think that you can sin against the Shem on purpose violate Shabbat be promiscuous waste seed do all these different things that Hashem said you'll get a punishment for we say no no but if I have bitachon it's gonna make it okay it's gonna if I have emunah I can walk around immodest. If I have emuna, then I can continue uh, doing all types of things that are against the Shem. Who told you this nonsense? Who told you? One of these uh, uh, gurus that call themselves rabbis or, uh, or Jewish speakers? Who told you this nonsense? Rabbeinu Bechaye says, someone who has bitachon in Hashem, while at the same time he transgresses his statutes and commandments, for which Hashem has promised to reward if you follow the commandments and threaten punishment if you violate the commandments. If he relies on Hashem, if he has bitachon in Hashem, his hopes will be dashed and he will not deserve to be called one who has bitachon in Hashem. Rather, he will be like the one who the Torah in the book of Job, chapter 27, verse 8 and 9 says, What hope is there for the hypocrite? who has robbed when God takes away his soul will God listen to him a guy thinks that if he steals by having his illegal business his unethical business or his gambling and so on he thinks no but if I have bitachon Hashem is gonna make sure that everything's gonna be okay you have a verse written about you Habibi you have a verse written about you where Kadosh Baruch says you're a hypocrite and there's no hope for you because eventually Hashem is gonna take all the money that you have and what about if you cry? It says, Shem's not going to listen to you. 
And even further, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter in chapter seven, verse seven through seven through eleven or nine through eleven, says, "Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name? Has this house which bears my name become a den of thieves?" Says Hashem. This is chovot alevavot. Simply put, if you follow the Torah, you earn yourself the right to ask Hashem for help in all that you do. And Be'ezat Hashem, He helps you in His timing and perfect timing of when you need it. Not necessarily when you want it, but when you need it. But if you're violating the Torah and you care less about the Torah and you desecrate the Torah privately, publicly, or both, by walking around immodestly, by violating Shabbat, by wasting seed, being intermarried, being unethical, being in predatory businesses, doing all types of thin, sins that simple logic shows that it's sinful. Needless to say, you don't learn Torah and you don't even know what's a sin and what's a mitzvah. You, my friend, have no right to expect Hashem to help you in anything. Will He help you? Sometimes yes, sometimes yes, but all of that help will come at a very heavy price if you don't return the favor by doing tshuva. You see, Rabotai Yikarim, one of the most important things that a person needs to know is that a Kadosh Baruch Hu, as Rabbi Akiva says, in the Mishnah in Avot, a Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world like a business and the employees are lazy despite having a huge responsibility, a lot of work. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us different things in the world in order for us to understand our responsibility, how the, the basics of the judgment works, the basics of reward and punishment works, the basics of the responsibility works. And a person needs to make sure to go and glue themselves to the teachers, to the rabbis, to the rebbitzins, to whoever is going to be teaching you Torah, that is going to stick and glue themselves and their audience and students and family and so on to the word of Hashem with no exceptions. And make that your rabbi. Make that your messenger from Hashem, your leader that's going to help you get to heaven by listening and following everything they say you do that and you have something to rely on even if there's a mistake that's made you still have something to rely on why because you followed the word of hashem by following the rabbis but if you're going to follow whoever is more modern and more appealing to you and more stylish to you and more this to you then as you've seen the chafetz chaim brings the the rama the shulchan aruch which is, if you don't go to someone that's strict with what the Torah is, you can simply serve an idol while you're praying in shul, Hashem Yishmo, without even realizing it. You can simply get cursed for going to pray because you walked out in the middle of Kaddish. Like, it's such, it's so easy to lose everything a person has to beg, beg his rabbi to tell him the whole truth. Beg his rabbi to teach him everything, with no exceptions. Beg, beg. Pay him to rebuke you. Pay him to tell you 100% truth. Why? It's, it's the only thing that's going to help. To look for someone that's going to give you everything is allowed, just commit suicide. Why? Because you're already committing spiritual suicide. And that's what unfortunately many communities are doing by looking for the leniencies of the heretics that we've mentioned in the past and unfortunately the heretics will mention in the future in order to protect you and to protect society from predators that sometimes have the mask of someone appealing, someone nice and even friendly. Be'ezat Hashem, we will continue our learning in this series and other series that we have and other teachings that we have to get closer to our Kadosh Baruch Hu, to bring strength to Am Yisrael, regardless of where they are, regardless of which community it is. 
but make sure that you yourself are taking yourself seriously and your Torah seriously by learning by studying and Bezat Hashem by doing everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says Baruch Adonai Le'olam Amen Amen. You know when you have a dream and you see a pretty woman? You've had that? Now you never actually see an ugly woman in dreams. It's always a pretty woman. And by the way, it's always the same woman for all of us. have a dream of the same exact woman. And she's more dangerous than the Satan himself. You're not even allowed to say her name. What are you going to call her for? It functions very much like drugs. People are addicted to it. I tried to quit dozens of times, hundreds of times. My fantasies and stuff, they're not mine anymore. Cabinet ministers, judges, diplomats, even one of the country's top spies. These men are accused of some of the most sadistic child sexual abuse imaginable on hundreds of victims. shouldn't take over your whole life. If you satiate it, you're never going to have enough. If you starve it and only feed it when it's permissible, according to the Torah, you're always going to be happy.